When I originally asked you guys what I should do with the AMD 860K, I got the overwhelming response to build a bang for the buck PC, and I gave that to you guys with my $400 gaming PC, which if you haven't seen, I'll link in the description down below. The second most voted was an ITX build, which don't worry, will be coming within the next couple of weeks, but the option that I plan on exploring with this video is making a very well-rounded PC. This build is based off the $400 gaming PC, but shows what I would do with an extra $100 and explores a scenario where I really don't care about getting the absolute most gaming performance, but instead wanted to improve the overall user experience with this PC. This build features most of the same components from the $400 one, including an AMD 860K, an ASRock A88X chipset motherboard, a Hyper 212 Evo, 8GB of a Vexair RAM, an EVGA GTX 950, an EVGA 430W PSU, and a 1TB Western Digital Blue hard drive. The parts that I added to improve the overall experience were a new case and a 240GB SSD for the boot drive. Let's first talk about the SSD. The SSD I chose is an OCZ Tryon 150. This is a great budget SSD and I actually did a review of it which I'll link in the description down below. This SSD offers 240GB of blazing fast storage for around $60, but I've seen it for as low as $50 with a $10 mail-in rebate. This SSD will hold the operating system, programs, as well as a few most frequently played games. The inclusion of this SSD will improve the overall experience greatly. To start off, the boot up time was cut in half compared to the Western Digital Blue hard drive, meaning you're able to get right into the desktop without having to wait a substantial amount of time. Some of the other benefits of the SSD include faster loading times, faster file transfers, and increased overall snappiness of the system. The SSD combined with the traditional hard drive gives you the best of both worlds, having your most frequently accessed files on the SSD with plenty of mass storage on the WD Blue. The other part of this build that I upgraded was the case. Though the case doesn't give you any tangible computing improvements, it does affect the overall experience. The case I went with was the Apiva QPAC 3 cube style case. This case features a motherboard tray that is rotated 90 degrees, making the motherboard lay flat as well as two large side panel windows allowing you to show off all your components. Though this case isn't perfect, for around $60 the case is definitely a step up from the Cougar Spike Mini Gaming Tower case. To start off, this case provided a much better building experience. It was much easier to build in this case because of how open it is when you flip the front and top open to allow for 360 degree access to your components. This case also features many more dust filters than the Cougar Spike Mini Tower case used in the $400 build. Even though looks are subjective, I really do believe this case looks overall much better and the fact that it has multiple side panel windows means you're able to show off your components. Also, because this case is easier to build in and has better cable management, that means it will have better airflow, allowing for more fresh air to reach all your components. So even though the build does produce the same scores as the $400 rig, I figured I would share those benchmarks again and also add in the Fire Strike score. The first game I decided to test was GTA 5. This is a great game to test because it's both CPU and GPU intensive and will show if the choice of the AMD chip was a wise one. Using the built-in GTA 5 benchmark tool, I saw an overall average of 52 frames per second and what I would consider high settings, but here are the exact settings for those of you that want to see them. Moving a few of these down, I'm sure 60 FPS average is possible, but 52 average is plenty for me. The second game I tested was Shadow of Mordor, which is another intensive game, and on the medium preset, the system was able to achieve a very impressive 58 frames per second on the built-in benchmark, which is very close to that highly sought after 60 FPS. I actually didn't overclock the GPU at all, so I'm sure with a slight overclock, 60 FPS average would be achievable. The final game I tested was Metro Last Light Redux, which at this point is an older game but is still very intensive. Once again, on the medium graphical preset, using the built-in Metro Last Light benchmarking tool, the system achieved an average of 57 frames per second, which once again probably could be boosted to 60 with a slight GPU overclock. Finally, in Fire Strike, the system scored a 5390 which according to the results is better than 45% of all results. So this shows this is definitely a bona fide 1080p gaming PC. 
So as you guys can see, this PC provided not only a great overall user experience, but also does very well in games. Though I could have used the extra $100 for a better CPU or GPU, the point of this video was to show how I would use it if I wanted to make a more well-rounded PC. I'm sure many of you will disagree with my choices in the video, so if you did, go ahead and leave a comment in the description down below telling me how you would have spent the extra $100. So yeah guys, this wraps this video up. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, share it, please consider subscribing so you'll be notified when I put out new videos, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.